Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Fam Vester podcast. I am your host, Sun Marie Burns. And I'm your co-host, Sunny Burns. And today we have a very exciting episode for you. We have a special guest on named Al Williamson, um, a.k.a. the world's first landlord scientist. Yes, and he is very technical, and he is a scientist in maximizing profits from your rental properties. He brings some very unique perspectives on landlording and the role of a landlord in your tenants' lives and and your community. One thing I really loved about this episode was how he talked about landlording from the perspective of community building. When you serve your community, you uplift your community, it in turn uh, works to your benefit too. And it's a, a synergistic relationship, symbiotic, where the better your community gets from you serving your community and looking for ways to make it better and to take action in your community, the better it is for you and for the whole community as a whole. So he's got a really inspiring story on how he transformed a neighborhood from being a place that nobody wanted to live to being a place that became the spot in the town to want to live. Um, He's written a couple of books about maximizing your potential as a landlord on your rental properties and um, investing in inner city rentals. So a really cool perspective on life. I think just his his mindset of service as a way to to build greatness is really profound. And we dig into that not only from his business perspective, but his world outlook on trying to think what can you do for others. Right, he's trying to create win-win-wins. Wins for himself by increasing profits, but wins for his neighborhood by uh, making a better place for everyone to live and you know a win for the t- tenant who gets to live in his nice properties now so just uh it was a great episode where he's talking about you know just trying to optimize everything and create the most value as possible right um and then we discuss short-term rentals and how short-term rentals has become so significant in his properties and really changed the landscape of his rentals um to you know what he focuses on now because he's able to maximize so much more net cash flow from these rental properties by making them into short-term rentals and it goes into why it's so significant and why it's only growing and why you should be paying attention to it right so a very fascinating episode a lot of good insights um and a lot of thinking outside the box i think you'll enjoy this episode so without further ado let's get to the show where's the snapping of the fingers I can't snap. You're listening to the FamVestor Podcast. If you're looking to raise your family with intention, gain financial independence, and live a life of true freedom, you're in the right place. Join us as we explore together how to create thriving families, because strong families are the cornerstone for a world at peace. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the FamVestor Podcast. We're here today with Al Williamson, and I'm really excited because we just had him at a northern New Jersey meetup, and he kind of unlocked all the secrets of short-term rentals with us. And at first, you know, when we had him there, I was thinking he was going to talk about the traditional Airbnb model, but no, it's com- something completely different, and he really blew <laughs> us all away with all the intricacies and all the um, knowledge he had regarding short-term rentals and all the potential that there was there that I had no idea. And it really kind of shifted my mindset a bit because, you know, we have uh, 11 units now and I'm thinking, you know, to maximize these uh, using his strategy that he kind of unveiled to us. So I'm, I'm really excited. I had I asked if he could come on the show and really share some of his secrets with us and share what he's been doing. So really excited to dive into Al's story. So let's all welcome to the show. Al, welcome. Hey, thank you. Happy to be here. Thanks for the grapes and the mints in the in the dressing room. <laughs> Our pleasure. Our, Our pleasure. virtual uh, treats. <laughs> yes, so, thank Al, you. you know, we like to kind of get started in the beginning here. So in regards to family, finance and freedom and the life you now lead, you know, with the freedoms you kind of have in place, where does your origin story begin? You know, can you just share us a little bit about your background? The origin stories was, I guess, a promise I made when I got married, you know, that my wife was going to have a good life. Mm. And then we started down rentals and um, found that it just wasn't putting out the, the net income that we thought it was. So we were both working at the time and we decided that she would stay home and we would start a family. So it was always really tight, even though we had uh, good in, 
good jobs, you know, well, at least I was an engineer, good, good paycheck by all standpoints. But why is it so tight? You know, mm. yeah. we had rentals and everything. It was just, you know, we, we were needing some, uh, some of my income to pay for the rentals. Mm -hmm. and, and it just wasn't, there's was always things going wrong, you know, always maintenance and things like that. So uh, that's how it is. And it started a quest to figure out um, how to get some additional income streams coming in. Mm -hmm. So that's how the, the first book of, um, actually the second book is called um, 40 Ways to Increase the Net Income of Your Rental Properties came about. I was searching for some different things that kind of make it so that I could eventually get time freedom. And I was looking like, man, this is going to take, I'm going to be 60 before <laughs> I'm going to be deep into my 60s before I can ever, you know, this feel the comfort that I was striving for. Mm. This It was always delayed gratification, delayed gratification, delayed gratification. Mm -hmm. And um, until I hit 50. And then it was, uh, you got to put up or shut up type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Either, either you're going to, either you're an entrepreneur or you're not, you're wired this way or not. For me, it was a lot of significance I had to give up. Um, corporate job, you know, I have a PE license and um, have some esteem that at least I think it had esteem. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, how my kids going to introduce me? You know, they still don't know how to introduce me. What does your dad do? Uh, he's a comedian. He's a, <laughs> uh, he's always on the road. He's a landlord scientist. And what's that? You know, <laughs> They said, just tell them I'm, I'm a real estate consultant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're kind of going back and forth. So. so so that's where it was. That's the backstory of uh, trying to figure out if it, if it was really such a life you could lead and um, experimenting with it. So shortly after getting married, you guys just buy a rental property? What got you into Yeah, was it the rentals? freedom? What was the idea there of going into it? It was, it, yeah, it was, it was just the idea of um, being able to put my blue collar skills to work. Mm -hmm. You know, I like fixing things. So that appealed to me. And then I kind of learned about forced appreciation. That's when you you um, increase your net income by um, getting more income streams in or reducing your expenses. Mm -hmm. And what that did to the numbers for these commercial properties that, my goodness, I could finally get paid for using my creativity. Mm. You know, it's kind of like my, um, you know, even if you're mentally challenged, God gives you this gift to kind of compensate for it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my compensating gift is my creativity. Mm -hmm. So I was finally able to use it in real estate versus um, engineering. I couldn't use it that much. Mm -hmm. So what was your wife doing at this time? What what kind of endeavors were she was she pursuing? And um, and how was she on board with real estate? Was she nervous about the idea or did she get as fired up about the idea of this uh, passive income stream as, as you were initially when you first started? Oh, she was, she was very supportive until we house hacked the first one. So <laughs> she loved the idea, Uh huh. but then we got a three unit building and I pushed her into one of the smallest units. Uh huh. And she wasn't so happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> the reality set. How long did you yeah. live there? We did it for five years. Oh wow! And yeah, it was it was painful for for me because she um, wasn't happy mm. with that. She she wanted she felt we were living in an apartment mm -hmm. and that we didn't have anything to to show for our education and everything. Mm -hmm. and, and but the place quadrupled in value. Wow! Wow! Then she was on board. She's like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah what what yeah. time frame is this? This is the uh, early 2000s, yeah. So 2006 is when we bought the place. Okay. And and then around um, around 2005, it, it 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 quadrupled. Well, we looked up the value and we're like, dang, <laughs> you know, this 144 thousand dollar three unit building, 1996, in 2005, it was you know 640. Ooh. Jeez. Wow. Well, that's powerful. So, yeah, that changed her mind a little bit. <laughs> it reminds me of the first house um, when Sonny showed me. He's like, this is it. This is the property we're going to live in and we're going to buy. Four family. This is our dream. And he shows me the picture and I'm like, 
oh, that is not a property <laughs> I'd ever want to live in and uh, certainly not own. And I I had a hard time wrapping my mind around it. And, and, and even when we stepped in and decided to buy it, it made sense. But part of me was still like, oh, I don't want to live here. <laughs> but uh, eventually it it grew on me and we made it beautiful and it became our own. Got and, to live for free. And it has uh, appreciated quite a bit as well. So it started to finally click in my head too. Um, like like your wife, I would say I was supportive, but it isn't always easy to swallow that pill because you do need to make those, those self-sacrifices in the beginning. Yeah. You know, you don't have the cute house with the white picket fence. You know, it's not a stereotypical beginning for uh, a young couple starting out trying to get their first place absolutely it's like um can't really have friends over <laughs> she was always embarrassed about <laughs> our friends or whatever our you know do what people think yep yep so <laughs> And then I believe um, when I researched your story, you got in, you went and bought an eight-family home, right? An eightplex. Right, right. So one reason it quadrupled is because we're doing this. Um, we're in the middle of this neighborhood improvement mm. uh, district, and we didn't know. We knew the area was getting nicer. It was it was trending up, but but we didn't. We weren't participating in the meetings or anything. Mm -hmm. So we bought in the inner city, and we decided that we were going to participate. Um, and, and help the effort along because if we could help uh, speed up the process that is added cash flow and wealth to us right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it, it was aligned with our self-interest and um, it really worked out mm -hmm. can you go into because i know you made a lot of efforts there like what some yeah. of your strategies were to improve that property um because i when i heard your story i was like wow that's incredible that you went through all of that too you were doing like block parties and things like that right yeah, block party is probably the biggest force multiplier uh, on it. I guess the block party would be equivalent to the sniper on your SWAT team. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a really powerful thing. The bounce house is is a major player because that's the, the code. So the police department knows whose house to watch, you know. And and um, it also, um, oftentimes with, for crime and, and uh, inner city craziness to exist, people can't snitch on each other. They, they kind of have to stay quiet and, and just kind of not communicate with each other. Hmm. So when you do a block party and everyone's talking it to freely, not fearful of you, um, it, it makes you want, if you're a drug dealer or doing something else, you want to leave that neighborhood. Hmm. Interesting. So you made your community really close knit and proactive and, and get to know each other rather than just be strangers who live next door to each other. Well, summary, there's even, it's even more subtle than that. What you're saying is absolutely correct, but let me back you up to, it's the effort in moving in that direction that causes, the, that repulses people and attracts people. Mm -hmm. Even though you don't get there, it's the, just like an electron moving through a wire. If we think about um, current and magnetism. Here goes the scientist. It, yeah, the very <laughs> movement the very movement causes people to att attract people to you and repels people. Mm. So just setting that goal and you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was years later that I was actually able to achieve it. People want to see if you're going to punk out and disappoint like so many, they're used to being disappointed inner city people. Mm -hmm. They're used to people promising them things and not delivering. Mm -hmm. So by staying consistent and, and uh, showing them what it looks like, what does the neighborhood look like when trash is off the ground? Mm -hmm. you know, when there's no litter on our block, what does it look like? And showing people with that and, and doing it over and over again. It's just like um, the scientists in me would say, it'd be like perceptions, but, but it's also like chanting or consistent prayer life or doing your affirmations, even though, or doing your yoga event, uh, salutations and things like that. That repetitive motion is what causes the perception and that actually brings uh, wealth and cash flow to you. Hmm. Interesting. So you really took on more than just buying a rental property. You took on the, the responsibility of transforming an area and you went in with that, that hope right. and that intention. That's really powerful. Yeah. You know, you went right. in to be, to bring uh, change for the better. And I, right. I love that. 
That's, I feel like that's not the way most people normally would be thinking, you know, when they go and they buy no. a house. They just think, you know, very linearly, this is my property. I'm going to worry about just this property, you know, and, and not think much about anything else around. And you are uh, really public minded in that way, which is awesome. Well, thank you. But I, I, I was a little more greedy than that <laughs> because the neighborhood, I call it the, the lid. It puts a lid on your neighborhood, uh, how much you can actually get for your cash, for your um, attract for your apartments, you know? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to lift that lid, you got to get the litter off the ground. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. if you put granite countertops in or if you have the best toilet or the best kitchen. If it's craziness outside the neighbor, your doors, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Wow, so it's, good point. You have to take care of the it's, and it doesn't cost anything to take care of your neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It takes costs very little. I spent, well, here's a couple of secrets. It's that the other landlords, they don't want to exercise leadership, but they're happy to write you a check <laughs> if you make the neighborhood better. <laughs> so you have all the money that you need to do block parties and, and stuff for the community. You have all the money, you just have to ask people for it. So you would mm -hmm. actually ask the neighboring landlords like, hey, I want to clean, I want to run block parties, and they would fund these projects? That's right. Wow. Wow. Happily. Wow. As long as you don't bother them. They don't want to be the, no landlord wants to be the problem in the neighborhood. They And, and they don't want to lead the effort either. Wow. So you got that set up, and then you got a neighborhood desperately needs a little bit of leadership, you know, someone to call when there's a street light out. Someone who gives a care, you know. Mm -hmm. So you got the money and you got the need. And then you got the, if you connect it, you get the, if you're a landowner, you capture the financial benefit of solving that problem. Wow. So, so you see how it all stacks up on everybody's self-interest, but it just takes leadership is the, is what lifts the lid more wow. than the ground or the, the granite countertops and the, I don't care how well you take care of your property. Um, it's the leadership in the neighborhood advocating for the neighborhood mm. that uh, richly is richly pays off. And I think if I was on my soapbox, which I am, <laughs> I say I say it's the landlord gets paid to do that. It's the landlord's responsibility. They get paid to do that to advocate for the neighborhood. Right. That's awesome. There you have it. That's my opinion, but I'm right. <laughs> so so let's see how right you were so when you purchased this property you know uh, yeah. this is way back then how much was gross rent at that time and how much is it like now oh geez gross rent oh gosh i was like it was like four hundred dollars a unit that was the going rent back in 2002 and these are one bedroom two bedrooms these are these are one bit um there was six one bit one baths and two two bids one baths Okay. Oh, wow. Okay. So the two bit one bath, maybe about five hundred, maybe, but everything else is four hundred. So and if now? you did the math, now the um, the the one bedrooms are eighteen hundred furnished. Wow. And the, the two bedrooms are yeah, it's a little bit over two grand. Wow. wow. So more than four times the initial rent. Amazing. Yeah. That's crazy. So these are furnished and you know furnished, uh, uh, short term extended stay rentals. You mm -hmm. know. All eight of them but are like that. I have three. I have three um, that are regular landlord, regular tenants, mm -hmm. and those go for like nine hundred. Okay. Around nine hundred, yeah. Okay. So, but the way it works is that my long-term tenants, they act like they're Airbnb hosts. Hmm. They take care of the place. They welcome everybody. They answer all the questions. They take really good care of. Uh, they really love on the the short term people, mm. and in exchange, I keep their I keep I don't raise their rents and I keep it real stable for them. Hmm. So it's, it's a nice all synergistic kind of a, relationship where that's they're it. they're helping you, and and um, they're getting a nice place to live, but they're also helping you in a way because you you can't be everywhere all the time. So here you have these. Uh, responsible tenants who are there uh, helping to convey the image and the vision that you have in exchange for a nice place to live well and the rent is a little bit low mm -hmm. for them okay so so That's it's all about trade-off 
it's a plane it's all self-interest mm-hmm. yeah, do they get any kind of commission or anything or it's just no. a reduced rent that's they're, they're, they, they, they know their rent is well below market rent okay mm-hmm. and then um, of course i take care of they get the benefits of the landscaping and all that grooming i have a groomer and things like that and someone who just comes and takes care of the so i have a landscaper a groomer and then a, a, a kind of precision gardener hmm. that, that a, a lady who loves uh, gardening and, and doing the details. So they get to enjoy all that and it's funded for all that. Um, where as a normal cash flow performer would not make that sense to do all that stuff. Mm-hmm. So I, I'm excited. I know like your big cash cow or kind of is a short term rental market. But you talked about before we dive into that, you talk about writing a book, 40, 40 ways to increase uh, maximum, you know, net cash flow from your property. Uh, can you share some other examples of that other than the short term rental thing? Yeah, absolutely. So there's some things I, I tried myself. And then I said, you know what, I'm gonna just categorize everything. So um, one of the big, I'll tell you my big loss, a big loser first, is I, I put an antenna, um, a Wi-Fi antenna that ha- could cover a half mile. That's what they said. Mm-hmm. And and I figured if I could transmit a signal uh, that gives everyone free Wi-Fi in that area, um, then I could get people to pay me like 15 bucks a month to, to have access to that. And they could say they won't have to pay their fifty dollars, eighty dollar internet fee. Right, makes sense. Yeah, and and then I said in exchange, I, I treat it like a coffee shop, a virtual coffee shop, where you go to get a cup of coffee, uh, you get to use the Wi-Fi, mm-hmm. but it's it's complimentary, right? So they're not reselling Wi-Fi; they're just letting you use theirs complimentary. Mm-hmm. So I said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have everyone buy a newsletter for 15 bucks a month and they get the Wi-Fi complimentary. Wow. So I can do a legal. That's a clever plan. So this is a community newsletter? That was the plan? Well, it's going to be very short. <laughs> It'd be like, what's going on in the community this month? Mm-hmm. Okay. You know, something like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then I had auto payments. I had everything set up and I get this antenna up there and it's blasting. But the trees snuff out the signal. Oh, no. oh. I'm like, okay, if I can get, if I can get, I can support 200 um, Wi-Fi devices. If I could get 100 people to pay me 15 bucks, I like the math on that. Mm-hmm. My apartment complex only cost my mortgage was $1,600 a month, and then if I could get, if I could sell the signal 100 times, 15 bucks a month, then bam, I would have it covered. I would I would double my uh, more than double my NOI and my value of my property would be like off the chain. I would have lease agreements and I would be just rolling. Mm-hmm. So if there was no trees, you think this would have worked? It, it would have worked until these def- smart devices got smarter and started needing more bandwidth. Mm. And there's so many more smart TVs and everything, smart tablets now. And so um, we would have to have upgraded, but still, there's no answer for for um, landscape interference. Mm. Still, you got you got you have to have more repeaters, and as you see with 5G, they're going to have to have more more repeaters, uh, especially for self-driving cars and stuff like that. Mm. You got to have it more um, density. So okay, give us another. That's one. my big loser. I, I love that's my the big, big creativity loser. of that yeah. thinking. I would have never even dreamed up that kind of a concept. That's really uh, thinking outside the box. Even though it so, didn't yeah. work, I think it it's didn't a work, brilliant yeah. idea. And I had uh, to explain to my wife, you know, it was three grand down the tubes. <laughs> <laughs> that antenna is now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. You win some, you lose some, you know. <laughs> yeah, she doesn't like the losers. <laughs> she doesn't like the losers. <laughs> tell us another. Tell us a winner. Okay, a winner would be there's several several different winners. Um, uh, I did bike sharing well before bike sharing was uh, popular. I would just um, include it in the rent and bring over international students. So a hundred dollar bicycle at um, attack on forty dollars a month, and um, nice. And also keep my vacancies down because all of a sudden it's like, well, do, do they have a bicycle? No, this guy has a bicycle, so let me stay there. Nice. Let me stay there, 
and and um, it, so that bicycle paid for itself many times over. Mm-hmm. So that was a great ROI on that investment. Wow! And lots of um, let's see, um, some of my ideas like um, it was a, a zip car was a was a popular idea back when uh, they needed parking spaces. So I have a, a friend in D.C. He started renting his extra parking space for two hundred dollars a month. Mm-hmm. So that was a big uh, cash flow there. Nice mm-hmm. to his things. Um, other things I've used were uh, payday rent from uh, Jeffrey Taylor, Mr. Landlord. You have rent, 50% of your rent for your monthly rent due every two weeks that lines up on people's, with people's payday. Oh, mm. smart. And as it turns out, since there's some, some weeks, months or four months, some months or five months, right? And if it's due every two weeks, you end up with an extra month of, of rental payments at the end of the year. Hmm. How's that work? My brain's not wrapping. Well, you just do the math. Yeah, just 20. So go ahead. (laughs) Sorry, we can edit that. (laughs) I'm just (laughs) trying to wrap my mind around it. Sorry. Our our Wi Fi connection is kind of getting loopy. Yeah, it's cutting a little bit, but it's not bad. I think it's workable. There we go. There we go. So so that's it. It's, It's like, um, Sometimes there's a fifth fifth uh, week in each month, right? So four four times a, a year, that means you end up with an extra four months or four four weeks in the, every year. So that's how you end up with an extra months of rent. Oh, interesting. They, you, they use that strategy so, also of paying down mortgages quicker instead mm-hmm. of monthly. You right. pay it down biweekly. And do you, right. do you give the tenants the option to do um, biweekly? payments right. or or monthly depending on, on what they prefer or do you exactly. much say this is how we want to do it hmm. That's no cool. no we give them option okay. and we tell them you know tell them all about it and um some people's budgets are just easier to do it that way yes yeah i think it it's easier especially for people who aren't good planners for um saving up for the rent at the end of the month you know if they have it coming right when the paycheck comes in it makes it a lot simpler for them to to meet that that need very interesting and it makes it easier for you to uh, draft draft out of their account too mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i can see that so these are very outside of the box ideas do you do you sit around with your wife do you do you you know, brainstorm creative ways of coming up with these ideas. They just come to you or are you researching? <laughs> I'm really curious because uh, my mind does not work like that. And I'm loving these, these little tips. <laughs> so, so I take other business ideas and I, I, I reverse them for land, landlords and, and um, uh, real estate. Mm-hmm. So whatever you see creative business model, you say like, well, how can that work in, in my industry? And also, you go to conferences. You run into people like Sunny, and you, and then you, you get their ideas, and then you write them down, and you make it easy for people to to look up. You know, awesome. That's that was the idea for that. That's the whole idea about uh, landlord science mm. is to to package things and 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 be really innovative. Mm-hmm. So that was a challenge. And can I come up with enough side income to cover my mortgage? And, and that's what I was able to with with stacking different uh, concepts on top of each other. Very interesting. So you weren't relying just on the the tenant rental income to make the numbers work for paying back your mortgage. You were coming up with all these other ideas that almost if that could cover it, the the um, rental income is kind of gravy on there. Exactly. The goal the goal is not to get the block out of my mind tenant rents altogether Mm -hmm. so that whether the economy goes up or down improves or whatever it does i'm good brilliant very very brilliant so are you're doing all of this while also working a full-time job um and uh, is that correct and your wife too you're both working a full-time job and you're still having the cogs turning and coming up with all of these ideas or did you step away from your engineering track in order to focus more on this um, landlording science and real estate portfolio? Well, I was, my, my wife has always been a stay home mom okay. for the past 16 years. So, mm-hmm. and, but, nice. and I was trying to get free, but I didn't really want to get free because <laughs> I had people answering to me and, you know, a baller. 
at work, get, got these great projects and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So once I got sick of that, I was like, you know, um, these, she's, these, uh, midterm rentals, these extended stay rentals that I've been doing is really enough. I, I really don't, don't need that income. We would be, we'd be fine if I stopped working. Mm -hmm. What is an extended stay rental and why'd you go that route? Um, well, I'm lazy, so I don't like all that churn. I don't like the one, two night stays. And um, I couldn't really, I couldn't, I wasn't comfortable because of um, worrying about dropping the ball and things like that. Mm -hmm. So I didn't like the churn. Of the Airbnb? And, and then I also, right. And, and then I, I did some experiments and I discovered that my net income for a month was about the same as my net income for doing three three times a, a month stays. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm. So I was looking at the net income. And then I discovered if I went three months, then my net income was even higher than all of them. So Al, you're kind of talking about all these ways of maximizing the profitability of your rental property. I'm assuming now is the part where you kind of start digging into Airbnb and maximizing it that way. Right, right. So, so in those experiments, I learned that it was the short-term rental platform that allowed me to do a bunch of upsells. Mm -hmm. Like, like once you start doing short-term rentals, then you have opportunities to do laundry service and car rentals and uh, other services maid service even though i didn't i didn't always do all those things but it, it gives you those uh, concierge services now mm -hmm. so that you can actually um, boost your in your income hmm. yeah so that's it's similar to um it's not exactly rents it's, it's more rates so to speak but um i counted it and it's one it was one of the the methods i used to uh, pay my mortgage without relying on my tenants or raising rents and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that part was good. And um, so there was an experiment I did uh, in 2015 is I, I rented uh, my two bed, one bath for um, three times in one month. And um, that was really, really good. Gross was great. Everything was great. It's just, I was kind of, um, I was on eggs, eggshells. Every time someone moved in and out, I was kind of, worried about it all and then I, I i got a month long rental and i rented it and my my net income was about the same mm -hmm. as as when i was renting these three times a month mm -hmm. when all said and done after after expenses and taxes and extra insurance um all that and plus my time mm -hmm. you look at all that together stacks on top of each other and then i got a three month rental and I saw that um, I didn't need extra insurance and I didn't have to pay any taxes, um, any lodging taxes. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so much easier to manage and my net income was uh, higher than doing frequent stays. Hmm. Why did you have to pay no lodging taxes for the three month rental? Because Sacramento defines, uh, and most, most communities define uh, stays less than 30 days as you know, they put their lodging tax on. Mm -hmm. That's why you see room tax and lodging tax when you go to a hotel. Oh, mm. interesting. Yeah, they stack it on you. They have a tourism. They put the tax on the tourists. Mm -hmm. So you see um, different bonds get passed in, in their city. And um, they'll say, oh, the tourists will pay for it. Mm -hmm. And they stick it on to them uh, by increasing the lodging taxes. But if you go to taxes. 31 days, you're safe? That's right. Because that's considered a month-to-month -month tenancy? That's right, yeah. Uh -huh. The whole that's definition of, of a transient is someone who stays less than 30 days. Mm -hmm. Most cities define that. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So because of that, you get you got some efficiencies, right? You got a, a hotel charging, um, lodging tax just keeps going. Um, for, and of course, you can... pick you over a hotel, for instance. I right, see. pick you over a hotel, and you can split the difference with the with your tenant, and they're happy with that because they're still cheaper, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. more profitable for you, cheaper for them, and it becomes that uh, triple win type of um, economy. I like a. I'm always thinking of um, triple win. So, Marie, you weren't there for my big. Um, no, I missed it. <laughs> my lecture, my talk on triple wins. I'm not sure. Does something that I talk about when I don't think you try you to help did, three really. people. 
Oh, okay. Well, it goes, it goes, um, you're always thinking about making that person's client win. Like I would be talking to you guys, you guys are my clients, but I'm thinking about your audience helping them win. Mm-hmm. And, and when someone comes to rent one of my places, I think about helping their, whoever they're, if they're on assignment, I want them to have a good night's sleep so that they could be more beneficial to at their work mm-hmm. to their, so it's a, a triple win. And I want to do it for less cost and everything. So that's the that's the economy that everyone's got to win. It's got to be a three way win, not just win win. It's got to be win win win, or I don't participate. Hmm. So who are these people that are staying like three months at a time? Oh, there's lots. There are, um, you know, fiber optics is pretty popular now. Those crews have got to stay in town for seven months. To put in those new fiber optic lines on the streets? Yeah, put in those new fiber optic lines. You know, anytime a, a Target store goes up or a box store goes up, a project manager is on site for two months. Hmm. And and also, you have uh, traveling healthcare professionals. Got lots of those. You got, um, we've had some, the wildest people we had was a, a group coming in town to update lottery machines. <laughs> they were three months. <laughs> Interesting. And then a p- polit- political season, you got people mobilizing for to sign um, petitions. Uh huh. And they, like, they have like four or five people come, and they'll hire a bunch of other people local, and they're in town for two months. Interesting. And how, uh, it goes on and on. How do you find these potential tenants? Because I feel like, uh, so they're out there, but I wouldn't even know how you get to that audience uh, with a, a regular rental listing i'm curious to know how you connect to them well there's different you use different um techniques for different audiences Mm -hmm. for for example like if you're if you're going after a concrete crew that would need like three hotel rooms then you would list on craigslist Mm -hmm. that'd be good craigslist temp housing and you would need to uh, not only list there but have the correct headline and pricing strategy. So it's a lot more than just there. It's, it's dog whistling and knowing exactly how much they can afford. Because if you're a dollar over what they can afford, you're not even going to be uh, showing up in their in their search. Mm. Mm-hmm. So it's like, like the price is right. They're like per they're, diem rate. They're, they're getting from their um, company. Right. Okay. Right. So like the price is right. If you're a dollar over, <laughs> you're out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... So, and if it's um, if it's student housing, then uh, as Craigslist will go. If if it's uh, if it's a professor on a one year sabbatical, you know, it might be uh, sabbaticalhomes.com. dot mm-hmm. so, so, and then of course Airbnb is the biggest of all of them. Mm-hmm. But you got to write the right headline, and and have your calendar set so that um, you can do that. For for example. I always tell people you have to transition or you have to commit to doing extended stays. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because if you have, um, if you want a a three month booking and you have your, if you you accept it a weekend halfway through, you're you're not going to get them. Right. So you got to have the strategy and then you have to have the, um, um, it helps to have reviews and to be a little established. Um, Also, there's a lot. There's a lot to it. Like, for, for example, summary, if you had to stay for three months and one place had a washer and dryer inside the unit mm-hmm. and one, say, didn't have one out uh, shared down the hallway uh, or uh, a laundromat nearby, you know, it makes a big difference, right? Right, the, right. But if you're if staying for a week, it doesn't really matter. You can right. you can make it. But washer and dryers and, and those types of uh, long-term thinking, mm-hmm. um, even also how trustworthy you are. If you have um, super credibility, what I call it, really credible, then people are willing to, to stay longer with you. But if you're a new host, um, not so much. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So, you know, you guys, I, got me. You guys, I feel like I'm talking too much. I feel like I want to ask you guys questions. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, okay, we're going to ask you some more questions first. <laughs> so, okay, you know, no you're problem. talking about um, about this great upside of, you know, uh, renting out your units for a lot more. And, you know, the turnover not being that crazy every three months or so you're renting these places. But it does take a lot of a lot more initial investment than an empty apartment that you typically rent out as a traditional landlord. Um, how can you mitigate the risk, like, if you list it and then no one books you know and you already like bought the couch you bought the sofa you bought the bed and all this stuff how can you know that you're going to be okay doing this you know what in 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 my segment that i encourage people to get into i I ask people to look for the presence of an extended stay hotel okay Hmm. because they've already done their research and they're and they're already um they're already filled with your people that you want to stay at your place. Mm -hmm. So in fact, you can't even do more research than than what they've done. Mm -hmm. Okay. So and then the next thing is, I try to say this as nice as I can. But if you're vacant, and there's an extended stay, and you're vacant, that means you're a piss poor marketer. (laughs) (laughs) Ha ha. So you're not you're not hitting the the needs of of the extended stay demographic. Yeah. Right. You're not you're not marketing well. If if you were well, Sun Marie, you're a nice you're a nice lady. Why thank you. <laughs> if you had a vacancy and I said, I'm going to uh, cut your husband's pinky off in two days unless you get this thing filled, you would get it filled. You would get out behind your. You would get out from behind your computer. You would market the right. place. Right, right, right. So a lot of people are just lackadaisical. They they're just sitting on their hands, twiddling their thumbs behind their computer. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, that's fine. My, me and my tribe, we're like we go we're going to war. If we have a vacancy, we're we're at war to fill it. You know. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you're doing extended stays. And you know you have a vacancy coming up, and you're still vacant. Then something is wrong with that. Mm. That means that means you're just being lazy. Mm-hmm. Mm. So you got to be one step ahead of the game. You you know your dates, you know your time frames. So you can't just sit back and and hope someone's gonna come to your door knocking and say, "I want to live here." You've got to hit the pavement. So what would that mean? Would that mean like me going to the local industrial park and saying, "Hey, you know, I have an extended stay for anyone." coming to work at the industrial park for a short term or something that's exactly right take wow. take some chocolates with you a gift <laughs> basket that's do exactly you, right do now, you that's do now this. what to do to save my pinky oh, i Wait, will but, notate that but 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 here's the thing <laughs> there's so much more to it than that it goes back to what we talked about with neighborhood improvement mm. the very effort of you moving that it causes people to look up and notice you mm-hmm. and your friends and your loved ones notice you and they say, hey, why don't I just talk to so-and-so who, who sits right next to me? Mm-hmm. And you get filled. Mm-hmm. As soon as you make that effort. And also, once you do this once or a couple of times at most, then you got so much. <laughs> you separate yourself so much you don't have to do it again. You got a whole bunch more people coming to you. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So you were it's like kind word of, s- of mouth. Yeah. And you were kind of saying you could still use Airbnb to kind of fill these as well. You just like I know for us when we just started Airbnb that people can book for one night, but I guess you can restrict it to only three month stays if you wanted to do that, or one month stays. Yeah, you can adjust your minimum. Okay. So you guys are offsetting your overhead. Mm -hmm. So ignore everything I'm saying. If you were taking one of your investment properties and and doing it, then then pay attention to what I'm saying. Okay. Because uh, because it's anything you do to offset your expenses is is it pays off. It's probably the most important thing you can do. Is that so? So do that. That's even more profitable than going spending money, and it's even safer uh, mm-hmm. cutting your expenses that way. Mm-hmm. So do do that first. Absolutely, mm-hmm. you're doing everything right. And so uh, then, when you want to reposition a unit from short stays to extended stays. It helps to have some reviews under your belt. Mm-hmm. We got five, uh, you can five, find five star yeah. reviews in the last three weeks. <laughs> yeah. So now there's no no really question about um, what you got. 
and you you made some improvements, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Any tips or people bring things to our attention? We're our shower addressing. wasn't yeah. hot enough, so I went in there and adjusted the heat limiter on there uh, it, yesterday. It was fine yeah. in the warm month a couple weeks ago, yeah. and now it's cooling right. down, and we've got feedback that's a little too cool. So we yeah. adjusted that, you know. Yeah. And we appreciate yeah. that feedback, that honesty, too. Yeah. Okay. So then if you wanted to, um, do extended stays. Yeah. But since this, you got, since this is your, um, your ADA unit, ADA. Um, your, 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 uh, site unit, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Attached so your house. Premises. Yeah. 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 It's not your ADA, ADU. Anyway, that's what we call it here. It's your grand, grandmother in-laws quarters. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with what you guys are doing. It might be a, a fun way for you guys to, um, work it out with your lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and and who's cleaning the? Who's doing the cleaning? Currently, we we are. But we do want to transition out of that. It's more like just making. We just made our own checklist of how we want it cleaned, and we had creating my... our system. Yeah, I feel like yeah. to do it ourselves lets us know what our expectations are, so that when we do go to look for someone to hire, we can explain very clearly our expectations. So we're kind of transitioning through that right now. So that's helping your profit too right now too as well. For yeah, sure. we're getting the thirty dollar <laughs> cleaning fee every time there's a turnover. Yeah, it yeah. is nice so not all sharing that. that. <laughs> yeah, a couple a couple of those pays for groceries for the week. Right? Yeah, you know we got one booking we booked like at noon today and it's a hundred dollars in our pocket right. just for one yeah. night. Yeah, right. there you go. So that's what I'm saying. You, you guys may not want to transition over. Mm-hmm. It may it may fit for your lifestyle that right. way. Right. Being just so, one unit, you know, it's manageable. It's right where we live. Um, yeah, it's right where you live. And that was something I was curious to ask you about because, you know, in the model of traditional landlording, the big job is getting the tenant in there. And then once they're in there, it provided you provide them with good equipment and everything. It's pretty hands off for the term of the tenancy. I mean, you'll get calls now and then, but there isn't a lot you have to really worry about. I feel with short term and maybe extended stay, uh, there's a lot more to consider. You know, every landlord has to consider landscaping, but when you're an extended stay, you need a landscape that's above the notch, you know, that gives that that real appeal. Um, Cleaning services, um, as you were saying, certain concierge services. Um, And I'm curious how you manage that, because that is quite a workload if you were to take it on and didn't have systems in place. So how do you manage all of that, especially with multiple units going at the same time? I feel it would be overwhelming for just you and your wife to run it. How have you set up a system where it isn't so all encompassing in your time? So it is it is self it is just like a regular passive landlord once a person's in. Mm hmm. We we don't do um, any cleanings in between mm-hmm. in between times. We we overstock on toilet paper, make sure they have plenty of uh, dishwashing liquid, and um, and we leave them alone. And that's one thing that they want. They want to be feel at home. They don't want any, any intrusions and things. Mm. So one thing I want you to be careful with is. Um, not really not understanding there's a difference in the landlord industry and the hospitality industry. Mm-hmm. There's a clear difference. You can't really project landlord industry onto the hospitality industry expectations. You know, mm-hmm. they're two separate things. If, if you're doing short term rentals, you are clearly in the hospitality industry. Um, you do things for people. Mm-hmm. It services, you do things to people. Um, but if you're in the hospitality industry, you do things for people to make them comfortable. Mm. You're hospitable. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you have to want to do that. And that's what's how you earn the extra margin mm. um, going into it. Mm-hmm. Now, you can do a hybrid of it. So you split it right down the middle. OK. And you're saying, hey, I'm just going to make it a do it yourself because uh, the, a lot of the industry is going to do it yourself. People prefer that mm-hmm. makes them more at home. So you have to have that. So you see, uh, there's all these strategies in between. I'm setting up for you to see. We can talk about this for a whole day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's strategies of expectations, and if you hit people's expectations, then they're happy. Yeah. And you want to, you want to exceed them by just a tiny bit. Mm-hmm. 
because that's the most profitable. Mm-hmm. You don't want to try, you know, you can get a five star review, right? But there's no such thing as a 10 star review. Right. So if you go overboard to get a 10 star review, you're wasting money. Mm. <laughs> True. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have to pick, um, pick your expectations, clearly define it in the listing mm-hmm. and also clearly define it in your mind. And as you communicate, um, uh, repetitive repetitiveness on what people should expect Mm -hmm. and then you exceed it by just a tiny bit what you want to do so al i kind of want to pivot here and talk a little bit about um you know the reason that this strategy is also powerful in that you don't need perhaps such a if you want to make this into a business of like a short-term rental business, how like, you know, we just bought, we just closed on a four family in this area. It was $600,000, you know, the Congratulations. Down pay, 20% down on that is $120,000. A lot of people don't have that to work with. Um, right. Like, but I felt like this uh, method that you kind of shared with us in our group was a very low barrier to entry to start some kind of real estate business. Can you just share a little bit about how that works? Well, that would be through a rental arbitrage part. Mm-hmm. Because, if you, um, what do you charge? What for your for a one bedroom? What does that go for? One for you bedroom are? is like for, twelve for fifty. Twelve fifty, and let's say uh, a hotel is like a hundred dollars a month. A mm-hmm. hundred dollars a night. Mm-hmm. So three thousand dollars a month. Mm-hmm. So there's a difference between paying. You can still pay someone full market rent and and and. Um, there's a and pay that and there's a difference between that and what a hotel gets. Mm-hmm. Okay. So because of that, you can capture some of that difference in between by fur- by by getting someone's place under under contract, leasing it up, furnishing it, and marketing like crazy to get it filled. And then you can enjoy some of that margin in between those two industries, the mm. the landlord industry and the hospitality industry. So you can grow your business based on that. And now you can pick and choose where you set up shop. You can you can get into the nicest place in town. Uh, you can get on uh, next to that famous restaurant or that nice ice cream parlor or that nice bookstore that people want to live by. Because mm-hmm. you can control the property, not with a, with a mortgage. You guys are controlling properties with a mortgage, but you would control it with a lease agreement. Mm. And that's what allows people to get in with a low barrier. Oh, that's very creative. Can you explain that a little more step by step? So you would approach a landlord who's trying to rent out his property and say, hey, I want to lease your property for a year, but I want to use it for short term rentals. Yeah, that's one of the lines. Exactly. Or you can show up at one of your um, your real estate meetups. OK. Mm-hmm. And you have haves and wants section. Mm-hmm. And I can say, hey, I want to talk to a lender who has a vacancy. I want to rent it from me. <laughs> and uh, the landlord who has a vacancy is in pain, right? Right. And they see you there and they uh, have your reputation and whatnot. You're established. You guys, you two lovely folks showing up at one of your meetings could get all the vacancies that you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> am, I, am I right about that? Yeah. 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 Probably. Okay. So if you okay. know the right questions to ask to the right people. Just ask yeah. during the have and wants. Yeah, just say what you want and and that you what you're going to do and that you're going to stand behind, um, pay, making sure you pay the rent. Right, right. Do you find that landlords are pretty receptive to this idea? Because I I do wonder when um, you approach a landlord, you know, they this is their livelihood, they're and they're going to all of a sudden too. start comparing. Oh. You know, I'm renting this, and my tenant is re-renting it, making all of this. I feel like a chump here. Like I wonder yeah. about that. Does that ever come yeah. up? And how do you oh, deal yeah. with that? That I means I deal with it by going to the next landlord. <laughs> <laughs> go yeah. stay. Stick with your vacancy. I'm moving on. <laughs> I, 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 I'm going. Yeah, stick with your vacancy. I'm going to go to deal with a landlord who wants to be more passive. Uh huh. And right. someone, you know. Some people have to take their, their their moms or their fathers to a care facility, ends up with a house that's a burden, and they don't want to be landlords. Right. Mm-hmm. They got a fully furnished house there, mm-hmm. and they just need money to offset mom and dad's care. Mm-hmm. So those guys want to be passive, and a lot of uh, baby baby boomers want to go visit the grandkids and and uh, start getting rid of their portfolios. Mm-hmm. And then also the the whole landlord dream, late night infomercial. 
is to have mailbox money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you give them that. So there's a big population of people um, on both sides. Mm -hmm. And those people who want to be your competitors, you just um, step sidestep them. Mm -hmm. If someone wants to participate in your profits, um, pending on uh, what you're going to do, because there's something called a performance lease. Mm -hmm. Based on your gross income, you can give them a percentage. Um, that that fits in with my triple win strategy. Mm. And um, so they get a yeah, little you bit can of kickback if it is um, profitable or something for you, and you know you're you're investing into the property, making it nice. It's kind of when yeah, is make it a make a percentage uh, per month mm -hmm. that they get. So their 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 income varies. Hmm. They so they exciting take some of the, them. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. So you're so Something. typically you'd be paying full rent, but you're also taking care of services like landscaping and just making sure the place looks nice and things. That's kind of the incentive for the landlord too. It depends on uh, it, it counts on which side. If you're if you're one unit in a sixteen unit complex. Okay. Yeah. If you have a little cottage, it's a different thing. Right. Uh, if you have an in-laws quarters like you guys, mm -hmm. I rent some people's in-law quarters. Mm -hmm. Then, uh, of course, you don't have the majority of the of the house. You're not going to do the landscape. Right. But it's all negotiable. Mm -hmm. This is like real estate. You make it. Make sure your your um, your partnering owner wins. You got to make it. It's got to be a win for them. Mm -hmm. Right. Or don't do it. Mm -hmm. And do you try to negotiate like longer term leases, like a two year lease? Because like you're going to have to put in some, you know, you have to buy the furniture and stuff. So you don't necessarily right. want it to end after a year. Do you try to negotiate right. that? Or usually you don't have an issue of just extending that lease further, further, further? Well, it all, you know, those are all these tools that you have in your toolbox case. Mm -hmm. You you want to you want to set figure out what your net income should be per month mm -hmm. and not spend more than a seven to eight months setting up of your net income so that you break even that first year. Okay. Okay. That gives you the flexibility to, to move. Okay. So you want to make sure you have that. And then um, depending on what the landlord's interests are, they typically are know how to do a one-year lease and they want to test you out anyway. Mm -hmm. So, so date them for a year and then go, you know, see where he goes from there. Mm. Your ideal thing, your up strategy would be, if you really want to be ninja about this whole thing, you you get an option on the to purchase their property. You know, sometimes, or you get an option to have the first right of refusal if if they get uh, offered to buy their property. Mm. So those are the types of things that allows you to to have what I call synthetic ownership. Mm -hmm. So you can capture appreciation as well as cash flow. Wow. Without the without the maintenance of the property. Interesting. Hmm. Wow. So many creative ideas here. Um, uh, gets you really thinking about a lot of uh, options that are are available to get into real estate, even if you don't have the capital to go out and buy a home. Right. You know, you can still make this a, a really profitable, profitable business business for yourselves. Um, which is really clever. I'm curious to dig into on on the personal side of your story. You were saying your your wife's been a stay at home mom. Um, and you have two daughters. Yeah. And you have two kids. daughters. Do you do you uh, involve your kids in any of this entrepreneurial project work you do? Do they help with some things? How are you teaching them about thinking outside the box in terms of you know lifestyle choices for? I'm gonna I'm gonna leave those guys a bunch of notes. <laughs> inside of their retirement accounts and that they're not they're not really they're, they're not interested in it right now uh -huh. they go with me but they're not really um that's not their that's not their cup of tea mm -hmm. that piece of it um so i teach them about note investing and maintaining that um my my wife has good intentions but she you know there's a pta meeting here and there's taking the kids there and um, she can't do, there's a lot of time sensitive things. So mm -hmm. it makes better sense for me just to hire that out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they still want, they, you know, they, they like the, I say the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. They're not really interested mm -hmm. in that. So, so I, I teach them about known investing and I, I kind of move my, my portfolio that, over that way. Mm -hmm. How old are yeah. your daughters? One's, one's uh, going to be nine. She would want me to tell you she's almost nine. <laughs> And one's one six, yeah. Six, so they're still 16. quite. No, no, sixteen. Sixteen. Okay. Yeah. So they're still she, quite she, young yeah. and 
perhaps not thinking in that vein, but I feel like right. I'm sure they've seen, you know, your example of, of how you're, you're creating this, this very unique, um, career path and yeah. uh, it's it's gonna impact them i'm sure in many ways and eventually they'll come back and say hey dad how'd you do that <laughs> <laughs> now i'm curious you know, now that i'm out they... in the real world working and i realize oh nine to five i don't Escape know that cubicle <laughs> yeah but right. i think what what they're gonna re realize what what's impacted them the most is them to see that i started off writing this, this blog mm -hmm. and they they gave me hell for are you working are you writing that blog are you writing <laughs> <laughs> and then and then that turned into something that to, to turn to books and that turned into something that I could uh, help me leave my, my nine to five job. Nice. And so they see me um, create something out of, you know, I have them vote on a different logo and then they see that logo on business cards and they see that awesome presentation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, years later and they, they, they know they, they that that came out of nothing mm -hmm. besides an idea. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want to leave with them is that they can um, work on something, come up with an idea. You know, like I say in, in a lot of my, my presentations that it's ideas and, and language that creates the cash flow. Mm -hmm. And if, if they can just come up with their ideas and learn how to express it so that they don't confuse people, mm -hmm. then they'll have uh, plenty of cash flow and they'll be fine. Mm hmm. I also yeah. really like something you mentioned there, which is, you know, figuring out what works for your dynamic. You know, your wife, mm -hmm. um, very important to be in the mix with the children's agendas at school and so forth. You know, having the time to be able to attend the PTA meetings and the the sports games, etc. Um, and recognizing that and, and creating this business without having it require more of her time so that she can truly focus on, on what her passion is, which is, you know, wholeheartedly investing in the children and you creating this flexible model that allows that. And I think that that was a uh, really great forethought and uh, uh, impressive how you pulled that all together. Now you're giving me way too much credit. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, a, it's not like I had a plan. It's just like it, you, you go down this path and say, that's not working. Mm -hmm. And then you do some vision planning of what I want my life to look like. Mm -hmm. And then it's a constant, hey, hey uh, what kind of decisions am I making? You know, you got to set boundaries up for yourself because not everything you want to do is good for your family. Mm -hmm. Right. So yeah. and the amount of risks you take. Uh, so it's always this, it's like you're steering all along. It's not like I'm, uh, I had it all figured out. Yeah. <laughs> so, Al, you have, you know, decades of experience running yourself as a landlord. You have a blog. Um, I'm sure you have plenty of resources that people can really dig into if they're inspired about this Airbnb model and not Airbnb, short term rental model. And if they want to get involved, <laughs> how can people, you know, get in touch with you, reach out to you and uh, learn more about what you have to offer? Because I know even in that meetup we had, you, you said so much more, too, than you just a wealth of information. So it, people can find me on uh, Instagram. I just start giving that out, leading underscore landlord Instagram. Um, you can email me, it's easy for the old fo fashion folks, at al at leadinglandlord.com. And those are the two best ways to get them. I don't, um, you can find me on Facebook. I'm everywhere, uh, LinkedIn, and all, all the f familiar places. And yeah. the blog is leadinglandlord.com? Leading, yep, leadinglandlord.com. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And the two books that you've written, uh, can you remind us the names of those again, if someone wanted to pick them up? Oh, absolutely. One's called Building Wealth with Inner City Rentals. Mm -hmm. That's the one. Um, my passion project was that. And then uh, 40 Ways to Increase the Net Income of Your Rental Properties is the second one. Mm. Okay. Great. Both very yeah. compelling titles there. So Al, Al before, <laughs> before we end the show here, what are, you know, I'm kind of curious because you have a unique perspective. You have a unique journey. Do you want to share like some of your best mindsets or attitudes for, you know, the amount of success you've been able to create? Wow. That's a good question. Um, for, for mindset, you know, it's, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing thing. Um, as far as whatever you do, make, if it's uh, to, to get yourself in that position, um, 
whether whether it's your prayer life or your thought life or uh, whatever it is, if it's your favorite TV shows that gets you into that positive state, um, that's that's really where you want to reside. You got to know where that is. Learn that about yourself, and um, I think quickly bouncing. There's going to be there's, there's when you start an entrepreneurial journey. There's this big dip in the road. <laughs> There's this big, you start off great, people congratulate you, but you, you're, you know, there's a cash flow dip that you're going to have to get through. So right. I like to tell people that right up front, hey, if you're going to do this journey, it's going to be a big dip. You're going to have a lot of negative chatter in your head, and then other people are going to tell you negative things during this dip. Mm. Um, be prepared to face it and to fight through it if you're going to if you're going to do this thing. Mm-hmm. If you're going to walk away from your job or uh, buy something in the inner city and try to change a neighborhood, mm-hmm. especially if you do that, you're going to get um, all kinds of, uh, you got to have a thick skin, I should say, mm. uh, for both journeys. You got to have a thick skin, otherwise you're going to get taken out. Mm. Oh. So so that's another that's another hour long discussion. <laughs> I'm not sure if you want to pick that. But yeah, I've got, I've had people. Uh, criticize me and 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 um, call me names until the results of what I do uh, come back and, and manifest themselves. Mm. And, and then years later, after their kids benefit from something I was doing, a job in the community, then I can get a head nod. But it's not, you know, some. I'm lucky that I I got a head nod before I was dead at my funeral. You know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So it's thick skinned if you're gonna if you're going to uh, try to be a change agent, or if you're gonna try to tap into, uh, we all have this greatness inside of us that if a, there's a natural disaster, you see it, right? Mm-hmm. There's nothing that we can't do, mm-hmm. and I always say, don't wait for a natural disaster to tap into that. But if you're gonna tap into that, you better have a thick skin. Mm. <laughs> Because people won't give you that leeway. Mm. They, they won't um, necessarily give you the benefit of the doubt until years later, until the result of your actions and decisions uh, manifest themselves. Mm-hmm. Wow. Very wise. Awesome. Yeah. And I'm kind of curious, you know, I know we're going long, but I'm kind of curious when you meet a young couple, you know, do you give them any sort of advice? Like do what I did with the house hacking thing or what do you, what do you kind of, is there any kind of entrepreneurial thing you share with them? Oh, geez. Um, stay married. That's probably the most profitable thing you can do. (laughs) Stay married. You know, um, house hacking is, is one, there's, there's several ways to the top of the mountain, I should say. Not just one. I can definitely tell them that uh, house hacking worked for me and many, many people because mm-hmm. uh, we didn't start with uh, start with any money really. We we started with putting my car up, getting a loan against my car to use cash, mm-hmm. and that was all by choice. So definitely act like you don't have money, mm-hmm. even when you do. Mm-hmm. You make make good uh, make really good decisions uh, based on that. Now you you know that through rental arbitrage in this uh, peak of the market where we are right now in 2000, um, what year is it? 2019. <laughs> um, we're at the peak of the market and we also at a time when next year, 30% of the workforce will be, have been born after 1990. Mm-hmm. So there's a whole, there's a whole younger generation of the workforce. And when, and when they go to think about a, a place, a, a hotel or whatever, the first place they go, all they know is Airbnb. Mm. Right. So there's a all major shift. Yeah, there's a major shift growing in the marketplace. So if you ignore short-term rentals, this is what I'm getting at. <laughs> if you ignore short-term rentals at this time when it's just, it's, it's almost you're being negligent. Because it's so profitable, you don't even need your own money to get involved with it. Because mm-hmm. you can quickly pay back your your lender, um, and through rental arbitrage, you can grab the the juiciest places in town, mm-hmm. and and through internet marketing, Instagram or whatever social media, 
you can keep the place filled. So uh, you can create a life of, of your choosing, really. You can write your own story uh, just with those things, just with that shift for the young couple is um, write your own story with that. I love that. Great advice. Yeah. Well, Al, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Uh, can't wait to chat with you more later. Uh, yeah, just thanks for joining us. Uh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I can't wait to, to dive into that steak dinner you guys got me <laughs> in, my dress, in my dressing room. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Have a good one. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye.